CNBC TV 18 Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024. CNBC TV 18, in collaboration with Setwork, recently organized the Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024 in the national capital. The two-day mega summit and felicitation event looked to unleash India's manufacturing potential and celebrate innovations in the manufacturing sector. The event brought forward new ideas and examples that can help manufacturers embrace technology, thereby helping make India the world's smart factory. Gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024. To kickstart the first day of Zetwork Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024, may I please invite on stage Shireen Bhan, Managing Editor, CNBC TV 18, for a fireside chat with Amrit Acharya, CEO and co founder Zetwork, and Srinath Ramakrishnan, co founder and CEO of Zetwork. Thank you very, very much for joining us. So let me start with that, Amrit. The aspiration, the dream of creating a manufacturing behemoth in India. Uh, manufacturing is not for the faint-hearted in this country spe specifically. You know, why did you decide to give up a cushy job in the US and uh, try and take this forward as an ambition and a dream in India? What excites us is the opportunity itself. Like, we are very much in love with the problem statement. How do we make India a manufacturing superpower? I think if you're able to deliver that within our lifetimes, then we can make a significant impact on the economy, on our lives, on the lives of people who are going to follow us. So, so for us, that is the motivation. And it makes everything worth it. You know, Sridhar, let's address that motivation. Because as I said, it's an audacious ambition that you actually have, is to create a, a manufacturing superpower in India, a courtesy what you are attempting to do at Zetwork. And it's a complex problem to solve as well. Five years ago, when you, you know, four of you from IIT decided to get together and actually get started, what was the ambition, what was the big dream that you were chasing after? I think five years ago, the vision was uh, fairly simple. We were definitely married to the problem. We narrowed down uh, the scope of the problem to one single sector, which was capital equipment sector, for one single category, which was metal fabrication. Uh, the goal or the problem that we were solving at that point in time was there were a lot of SMEs who had underutilized capacity. How do we bring in the capacities together and then layer with problems of quality assurance, uh, production planning, procuring raw materials on time, mm. and then solving the problem of predictable predictability or, and reliability for the customer. Because the buyer is definitely interested in on-time delivery yeah. uh, and uh, zero quality escapes, right? And complete transparency, visibility, traceability, right? So this was a narrow problem and uh, for one single sector, and we spent like two years only solving this problem. And then, of course, after over a period of time, the vision kept getting broader and broader. We started touching other sectors, more sectors. What is the plan now? You're across, what, 20 plus sectors at this point in time. What is the ambition from here? I think the current thinking is uh, we want to go deep. We are present in few categories, which we're pretty excited about. I'll start off with today, 25% of our revenue comes from the US. These are all customers who used to previously buy from China and are now looking to buy from India. Uh, it's across a broad range of industries, but like solar is a big one. So we want to spend a lot of time on the US market. The second is... And this growth has been quite rapid, hasn't it? Like two years back, our US business was 0% of revenue. Today, it's 25% of revenue. So it's growing faster than the rest and of the And what company. do you think was the inflection point in you going from 0 to 25? So big part of it was COVID. Um, so COVID exposed two things, that supply chains are highly fragile and com companies were dependent on one single source, which was China. Yeah. Uh, in the general scheme of things, it works fine, but in a, in a, it can negatively impact them in a big way. And yeah. hence, every customer you talk to today is like, how can I diversify? Yeah. And they're not saying I want to replace China because China has a very strong value proposition for them. But how do I diversify and have at least one more country, which could be India, uh, as part of my mix? And that, that really started during COVID mm. uh, because it really exposed the fragility of supply chains globally. And, and I would say it's the year one, year two of a 10 year, 20 year journey that we are on. And hence, uh, when you see such a large opportunity, why do something else? 
I think it's that one, one is that part of the thinking. And we started thinking, where else does this theme apply? Which are other industries which are looking for similar uh, problem statements? And in India, consumer electronics is going through a similar wave. Yeah. Where we are trying to localize, make in India, aerospace and defense, we're trying to localize, make in India. Previously, used, we used to buy from other countries. So these are core capabilities being built in the country today, yeah. uh, which had not been done before. And hence, today, this is a great time to be in this category. The fact that there is a big move towards indigenization across different sectors, defense being a big one, which is a focus area as far as you're concerned, aerospace and so on and so forth. So the, we're going now from import substitution to saying, let's make in India, not just for India, but let's make in India for the world as well. How are you looking at that opportunity, Srinath? No, I think it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity for company builders right now in, in manufacturing sector. Uh, these are two broad things that we see from our vantage point, having, uh, uh, having the experience of operating across multiple industries. One is, uh, one is India is definitely thinking import substitution, and India is also uh, successfully incentivized creation of domestic manufacturing capacities. Example, electronics. Yeah. Uh, it, it is unfolding in, a, it is going to unfold in aerospace and defense with the offsets and multiple things happening there in a big way. Uh, so it is definitely a fantastic time for entrepreneurs to, to sleeve up and create capacities and also rise up to the challenge of, uh, of, of uh, building a reliable Indian manufacturing company. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the founders here of Zetwork. We wish you the very best. Well, with that, we look ahead to the future to be the potential of tomorrow. And for that, I would now like to invite on stage the group CEO and MD, Mahindra and Mahindra, Dr. Anisha, for a fireside chat on the power of possibilities Indian manufacturing at 2030 with Shireen Bhan, Managing Editor, CNBC TV 18. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my very first question, the finance minister was at a FIKI event, and Anish is also the president of, of FIKI. He took over very recently. The finance minister once again reiterating her pitch to industry. The government has done what it could to drive CapEx, and now it's the turn of industry to pick up the pace as far as private investment is concerned. And the second aspect that the finance minister spoke of was, look, if you need technology, go out there, Inc. joint ventures bring global companies to India. That's the government's message to industry. Are we finally going to see a pickup as far as private investment is concerned? It's been coming in in slivers across some sectors, but what's the sense that you get in 2024? Uh, the sense is that the private sector will pick up its investments. Uh, the finance minister is absolutely right. In fact, in my introductory remarks, I had mentioned that Private industry is going slow in terms of its capex, and the government spend over the last three years in capex has actually helped the industry. Uh, and I would give a lot of credit to what the government has done because if you look at the last three budgets, capex spend has been far higher than what it has been in decades. Historic, prior to historic that. Uh, numbers as far as capex is concerned. These are historic numbers, and capex has a much greater multiplier. It's much easier to have political SOPs given, which have a much smaller multiplier effect. So the budgets over the last three to four years have been for the long term. Mm. And as I've called it, it's economics over politics. And that's a great place for the economy to be. Mm. Private sector has been a little slower. And there are reasons for it. Yeah. The reasons are we've seen a lot of uncertainty around the world. We talk about the VUCA world at some point in time. That world looks like a very nice, tame, calm world <laughs> compared to where we are today. Right? And suddenly we see all these things happening and the private sector will look at it and say, is it the right time for me to invest mm. given all the challenges we are seeing? And that's why it has been a little slower. At the same time, there have been some segments where there has been a lot of investment. Mm. Right? In the auto business at Mahindra, we've doubled our capacity in the last two years. Right? And it wasn't an easy decision to say we're going to double capacity in the face of the world slowing down, inflation, potential recessions, et cetera. Uh, and there are a number of other sectors where they have put in more capacity. But what we are seeing today is capacity utilization is starting to hit 75, 80, 85% in certain sectors. And that is where we're going to start seeing more investment coming in. We are seeing India stand very strong 
in the world. Uh, you know, we were just talking about the opportunities, for instance, in the aerospace and the defense sector, sectors that you are also involved with. Of course, the auto sector, and we've seen what's happening as far as the auto space is concerned, farm, farm and tractor equipment as well. Uh, you know, just across the length and breadth of the spaces that you operate in, what gives you the most confidence today? What are the plans that you see yourself focusing on over the next few years? So, Shireen, we operate, as you know, in 20 industries, and we mapped our industries against where we see India's growth in the next decade. And we play in about 70% of India's growth. Um, and every single sector is seeing huge opportunity. Uh, let me leave aside auto and farm, which obviously have tremendous opportunity. Uh, if you look at real estate, it's booming today. Yeah. You're seeing that across different markets. And our real estate business is really very aggressive and moving out and growing at a very rapid pace. Hospitality. Uh, logistics is still very early in its growth phase. Uh, and for India to grow as a manufacturing base, logistics is going to have to play a much bigger role as we go forward. Yeah. Solar is one that already is growing rapidly. We would set a 5x target for our solar business. And we're now looking at it and saying, should it be 7x or 10x? Mm. In fact, we just had a discussion in the last few days saying, should we really take those targets up higher because we are growing at a much faster pace than we had expected. Uh, and I could go on. I'm going to end by asking you, what do you do to ensure that the teams remain agile within such a large conglomerate across so many different sectors? Not just agile, but also that they don't operate in silos. What is the culture that you're working to create, and how do you create that? So first is our RICE philosophy has been the one that binds us together, because our focus is on driving positive change in lives of our communities to enable them to rise. And that's been one that helps us look beyond ourselves. It starts with others and then comes to us. And then there are three behaviors that we insist of all our associates, which is being agile, bold, and collaborative. Vanisha, thank you so much, as always, for joining us here at the CNBC TV 18 Network Smart Manufacturing Summit. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. Thank you very much for your time. CNBC TV 18 Network Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024. We now move from one power pack session to another, which is themed pathways to smart manufacturing, policies for innovation, inclusion, and sustainability. To moderate the session, I would like to invite on stage Parikshit Lutra, Bureau Chief, CNBC TV 18. Uh, without much ado, let me just uh, begin with our guest. Uh, Mr. Jain, let's begin with logistics. Bringing down the cost of logistics is something that Minister Gadkari, as Road Transport Minister, has been speaking about for the last 10 years. We've achieved a great deal. We have a national logistics policy. Uh, what is your personal vision in terms of what you would want to achieve in the next five years? Ten years of Make in India, what have we achieved with our logistics policy, with our cost of logistics, and what is our vision? We had our logistic policy in place, which was launched in 2022, if I recall correctly, 17th September. We have made great strides. Our logistic LPI rank in the world moved from 44 to 38 and that was a very rapid progression of words. Logistic performance index is based on four parameters. One of them is the freight cost, other is inventory, third is user and administration charges and fourth is warehousing. So at that point of time we used to look at all four verticals when I was in industry but coming to this infrastructure ministry here, freight is one thing we are making a direct impact. For example, if we take Delhi to Mumbai corridor, the kind of roads which we are building. Delhi to Mumbai, earlier a truck would take about 72 hours. So instead of 72 hours, the travel time will reduce to something like 24, 25 hours. And when I'm comparing apple to apple, because 72 hours also has the rest time of the driver. So take it about 32, 33 hours. So it is less than half. So the rental for the truck goes to less than half. The, rent, the manpower cost goes down to less than half. And more interestingly, the actual diesel consumption goes down to about 42%, by 42%. So therefore, the whole cost of freight for transporting certain things will go down to almost about half or 60%. So when we talk about logistic cost of 14%, out of that the transportation cost is about 7%, that itself will go down by about 3 percentage points. Hmm. Plus a lot, whole lot of things, like if you recall, uh, ULIP had been launched. Hmm. 
so that actually improves the administrative and uh, administrative charges a lot with just one app you are able to connect 34 databases of the country and you are able to get that data that will also move things to something like link, uh, single logistic document exchange systems so with very smoothly and seamlessly you will be able to transfer the goods from one place to another so this is how the whole logistic game is going to change and as part of the vision we are going to focus on the access controlled highways mm. right now we have already constructed about 4000 km of high speed corridors another 6000 km of high speed corridor is under construction and as part of the vision we'll be looking at something like another 40000 km that is the philosophy going forward and once you have access controlled high speed corridors the logistic of uh, efficiency will be transformed all right so uh, more access uh, uh, controlled corridors in the country to promote ease of manufacturing let me get in mr bhalla at this point mr bhalla you've got a tough job at hand the whole world is looking to india saying that no decision on climate action can be taken without india's support there is pressure on us to set very tough uh, uh, carbon reduction targets have faster transition from uh, fossil fuels as well but we have to do it at our own pace a pace which does not harm our industrial and economic growth keeping these factors in mind uh, what is the role that you see for manufacturing we've got manufacturers from across the spectrum here the next 10 years when it comes to our renewable energy transition what is the opportunity that you see for india inc a lot needs to be done by everyone as far as decarbonization is concerned we have set a target of you know achieving 50% of our electricity from renewable sources by 2030 that's a that's a international commitment we have made we also set a target for 500 gigawatt of non fossil electricity capacity as far as the availability in india is concerned but this also needs to be used i mean in the sense that this is something that we will produce but somebody has to use it the discoms have to buy the manufacturing sector has to purchase and of course the other domestic other sectors of the economy also so this energy which is now going to be available we are already at 190 gigawatt or so in non fossil we have about 180 gigawatts under implementation so we have the balance which needs to cut up we, we, in the next seven years or so the manufacturing industry not only needs to decarbonize in everything that they do they need to look at what is the electricity that they procure can it be greened in whichever way uh, we already have open access rules where anyone who has a consumption of over 100 kilowatts can ask for energy from any source including green ones of course and therefore the manufacturing industry can look at this option of mm. procuring renewable energy to decarbonize what they are doing the everything which will be done you know electricity is only around 18 to 19% of india's energy basket mm. the rest of it there's still many other you know uh, energy sources which are tapped in the overall mm. uh, you know uh, uh, india's energy basket purchase is there something the in fact everybody is now looking at benchmarks of deciding what they should be procuring so i think every industry will look have to look at what their you know the the the, the industry that they sell to is wanting mm. their clients and of course looking at what they can do for the environment in, as such thank you very much uh, for joining us and thank you very much in the audience as well the upcoming fireside chat titled 10 years of make in india delved deeper into the policy initiatives undertaken to make india a manufacturing superpower let me start by asking you for your own assessment of the performance of the make in india program over the past 10 years how would you rate it you will recall that when we launched it in 2014 uh, the focus was really on a campaign to uh, you know a kind of vocal for local make in india uh, to create an enabling facilitative environment for business so there were initiatives like the ease of doing business rankings for states there were uh, you know there was a, a huge focus on logistics on improving our physical infrastructure over time it also spilled over into our digital infrastructure we also tried to further liberalize our fdi policy and that 
process continues with the recent uh, cabinet announcement on liberalization of the FDI policy for space uh, sector, which also DPIIT piloted. So those were the sort of enabling factors. And thereafter, you could say that uh, the government further walked the talk when it came to Make in India by launching the uh, missions like the production-linked incentive scheme for 14 sectors of the economy and a separate uh, semicon mission for uh, the semiconductor side. All of these are meant to ensure that our uh, fairly abysmal uh, uh, you know, contribution of our manufacturing sector to the GVA of the economy, mm. which in the recent interim budget's uh, economic review is shown at about 17.4%. That's not very far from the contribution of agriculture. We, that how we can really bump it up. Let me ask you about FDI, because that's another important aspect that you brought up. And of course, uh, the last few years through COVID, et cetera, we did see a a uh, very sharp surge as far as FDI inflows are concerned. But in the last year, 2023, we've seen a decline. And I know that when we spoke previously, you, you said that you believe that this decline is temporary. Uh, what would you attribute the decline to? And are you now starting to see any visibility on a, a pickup and renewal? So it's good to look at FDI in terms of longer term trends rather than the yearly, you know, yearly ups and downs, because sometimes one or two big deals can uh, you know, lead to an uh, upside which may be temporary. If you see uh, it as a percentage of our GDP, you'll find that uh, in 2014, we were at about 25 2.6% 2 of the GDP. In the next five years, it became about 35 Now, it is close to 4 There is a side dip this year. The dip is far less uh, in India as compared to many of the other competing uh, destinations. But uh, from the government of India's point of view, the real issue is that in terms of overall FDI flows, we are eighth in the world. Mm. We should be going up. Uh, most of the seven on top, you know, who are ahead of us are developed countries, but there are one or two de developing countries in that list. Our intention is to sort of really move up there because this is the time when the world is looking at India. Mm. By all accounts, we provide a fairly sort of... Uh, a uh, clear case for investment uh, in terms of the uh, both the po uh, policy stability and continuity as well as the uh, political stability and the macroeconomic numbers that uh, India has. So it's a compelling case for FDI and we are very confident that the trend I mentioned yeah. of an increasing portion of our GDP being, uh, being com coming in as uh, FDI will uh, continue. Mr. Singh, always a pleasure. Many, many thanks for giving us very comprehensive but a very clear roadmap on what we can expect the government to focus on going forward. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for the DPIIT Secretary. Thank you very much you. for your time. CNBC TV 18 Z-Work Smart Manufacturing Summit 2024.